Jetzt kommen wir zu der Frau, wo Oliver vorhin meinte, hm, do I lead at home? Naja, eher nicht, das macht sie dann wohl eher. Senior Java Developer bei Stylite. Das ist ein absolutes Männerdomain eigentlich. Und Women in Tech haben es oft nicht ganz so leicht, wie wir vielleicht denken. Ähm, Katja Kempkens wird uns jetzt gleich ihr Weg in dieser Branche erzählen. Sie hat einen beeindruckenden Lebenslauf mit USA-Aufenthalt, Russland-Aufenthalt, Deutschland dann wieder, deswegen ist sie auch heute Abend hier, was uns sehr freut. Sie wird nicht nur Einblicke geben, sondern bestimmt auch ein paar persönliche Anekdoten mit uns teilen. Herzlich willkommen, Katja, auf unserer Bühne. Ich hoffe, ich bin den correct controller. We will see once I start scrolling. Um, so today we're talking about the future and how the new digital trends and technologies will change the way we communicate, the way we work, and what it will ultimately mean to succeed. I have a six-year-old at home. Actually, currently he's here. He's not at home. Um, but I too wonder about his future, how it will look like, what kind of tools does he need, what kind of qualities does he need or I can help him develop to succeed. And I think that uh, some of the qualities are perseverance, resilience, open-mindedness, versatility, and initiative. And I would like to draw on my personal experiences growing up, uh, life events and my choices that helped me develop these qualities. So I was born in Russia, in Soviet Union, um, in the year of Summer Olympics. Um, my parents were journalists and worked a lot, and so when I was the one year old, I joined the Russian educational system, meaning the kindergarten, and uh, I spent a lot of time in there. I think it was a full day from eight to six, um, and occasionally I would even spend the nights there. And it was not something that it was frowned upon in the Soviet Union, because productivity was valued above all else, and things must have been you should sacrifice things, and parents need to work, they need to go to the factory. And common notion was that the professionals at schools and kindergartens will provide better care than parents at home. And another value that was propagated across the country was physical agility and strength. And I think the Soviet Union would like to be perceived uh, from the outside world like this, with these beautiful human beings and um, strength was the sign of beauty, not the size of your waist or the color of your hair, but rather being physically strong. And so at the age of four, I started doing uh, rhythmic gymnastics. I did that for about a year. Then I ventured in figure skating for a little bit. And uh, my mom, being a journalist, she was interviewing a coach uh, in a swimming pool. And she found out about this new sport called synchronized swimming. And she was so enchanted by it. Oh my god, beautiful women in this swimsuits and makeup and music. And it's so artistic and yet so athletic, so beautiful. I must take my daughters to the Olympic swimming pool. And so this is the actual swimming pool where I spent the next 13 years. Could call it my second home. Um, I cannot point, but I think you can see a synchronized swimmer <laughs> over there. Um, I would say the next 13 years for sure definitely helped me develop resilience and perseverance because things were not easy for me. They were not coming easy because I lacked specific uh, physical abilities required for the sport. I was, I'm really inflexible. I cannot do splits at all. It's always a pain. Um, my bones are quite heavy, so I don't float in the water. And in addition, I would distract other, um, my teammates by constantly talking to them, which annoyed the hell out of coaches. They would always complain, say, Katze doesn't work. She, all she wants to do is just talk. So yeah, it was mostly social experience for me. But the director of the club, for some reason, he saw something in me, and he said, OK, we'll just keep her. We'll not kick her out. Back in the day, they used to kick out people. And they don't do that anymore, because now it's all paid. Anyway. Um, I was surrounded by a lot of girls more talented than I was. Um, they were, 
I would place 30th in a competition or 50th, but I was never discouraged by that. I was not comparing myself, saying, oh, she's so good and I suck, or I should just stop coming. Um, for me, the goal was always to, I would just show up every day and I would just work on something to do something better than I did the day before. Just show up. And I think ultimately the next 13 years were a competition with myself. I, for me, it was just important to improve, just to give it my all. Um, and I guess I could summarize that in the wise words of Dory from um, Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. And what you notice, or what I noticed, that all these talented girls over the years they stop coming to the pool. Their, some, their life tends to bring and to change some circumstances. They would leave due to health reasons. They would choose uh, school over sports. And so you notice that you just sports is a constant progression to the top. You never stay number one just because it's not a given, but also just because you are 30th of the year before does not mean you're going to stay there if you keep working and you keep improving. And at the age of... I guess 13, 12, I was given a really nice coach. Not nice, I mean, she was really good and talented. And um, she gave me a lot of individual attention. She believed in me, and there was a huge growth spurt, so to speak, once we, once we joined our forces together. And by the age of 16, I was good enough to join the Russian junior national team. And with hard work and a little bit of luck, uh, we won the... World Junior Championships. Um, if you know, if I thought about it when I first started at six, I would, it would never, of course, occur to me that this was possible. But it did become possible. And sometimes you are the last warrior standing on the field, you know, last man standing. And it's just hard work pays off. Um, after that, I joined the Russian national team. And what I started noticing, that the spirit of athleticism, of goodwill, of this joy that I noticed and I, camaraderie was disappearing because it was replaced by politics and power games. And after about two years, I was quite disillusioned with the national team. And so I decided to leave. So I left, and then I stay there, and I think, okay, for the last 13 years, I was told what to do, when to get up, what to eat, when to show up. Um, I have not really looked into additional... Inter I, have, I had no additional interest. I did not explore math, uh, theater, um, uh, I don't know, what else, art. And so I'm standing there and I have no choice. I was a bit lost at the time. And then a friend of mine approached me from California and he said, you know, I know the school in California and they have a synchronized swimming team. And maybe, maybe you should apply. It would be fun. And maybe the coach can help you with the application process. And I, I thought, well, this is just a challenge. This is great. Sounds like an adventure. For me, I think it was mostly leaving Russia. It was something that was big enough for me to bite. And I really like big challenges. Um, and so I ventured into this. Um, for the next year and a half, I, was, I did not get in the first year I applied. My scores were not good enough. Um, but the coach from this team, and I have to say, I did not do my research. I did not know what the school was about. I knew there was a pool. So all I, all I needed was somehow to swim in that pool, and that's all I, all I knew. And um, so, but I would say that never stopped me, you know, not getting in. I was thinking, you know. Again, sport and perseverance has taught me that until there is something to be done, I will be doing that. So until, I, until I've completely exhausted the, lift of, the list of possibilities, I will continue pursuing my goals. I'm very goal-oriented. Um, and so, sure enough, next year I got really good SAT scores, I got really good TOEFL scores, and I convinced the dean of admissions that I'm worthy, and um, I got accepted. Um, I think the, to say that it was challenging to study at Stanford would be a huge understatement. Um, but I think the two biggest takeaways from my time at Stanford was the open-mindedness and initiative. Um, at Stanford, I mean, it could not be more different from the Russian Soviet educational system. Um, students are encouraged to ask difficult questions. They are encouraged to challenge the status quo. 
And this was something that, for me, was, I mean, you have to understand that the Soviet, uh, good Soviet pupil is the one who executes well, who follows directions well, someone who does not question authority. So that was something that, I, for me, was the first time to learn that anything is possible. You just have to think about it. If, if you can think it, you can make it happen. Um, so this is just a photo of me on the team. Some people tell me they cannot identify me. I will not give you tips. I'm on that picture. Anyway, um, so this is a how Russian Soviet educational system works. So you sit there, and the knowledge is pushed to you. You sit there, you consume it. Generally, the perception in, among my peers is that studying is ugh. You don't want to study. You don't want people's eyes don't light up when they talk about some kind of this field is very interesting. Or I'm excited about robotics. I'm excited about something. Um, when you enter school or university, the program is decided on the day that you enter. There's no flexibility. There's no freedom to choose what you want or experiment with things, which can be quite more opposite from what I experienced at Stanford. Sorry, the picture is not too focused, but. This is one of the sections where you go out with a section leader, you sit on the grass under the tree, and the teacher is encouraging you as asking questions. He's not telling you what to think, but rather what to think about. So this is, uh, there are classes about critical thinking, critical writing, critical anything. So you're supposed to always analyze and question and come up to your own, with your own conclusions. And so for me, I think it took me about two years to learn that I am in charge of my career. I'm in charge of my education, and I'm to define the course of what I want to learn, what I want to be. And this is something that no one is there going to tell me, hey, you need to take this class, this class, this class. Uh, at Stanford, there's such a thing as custom design major. I mean, students can design their own major. And while I was at Stanford, besides taking computer science classes, I was taking French, I was taking dance, I was taking music, just because I could. And, of course, this also fuels into the versatility. So I graduate, and I'm in the middle of the Silicon Valley. I have to say, back in the day, I, wasn't, I didn't know how huge it was. I mean, I also, I think it's really become even more huge than it was back in 2004 long time ago. Um, and so I graduated, didn't have a plan what I want to do. Computer science is quite a broad field. You have a lot of possibilities of how you're going to apply it. So I went to a few career fairs, and I joined a company called Digital Chocolate, just because the guys were cool. So I think fresh out of college, I thought, these are the guys I want to spend my days in the office. I don't want to like, and I think the movie Office came out around the same time. So the vision of joining like a company was kind of scary. So I joined a startup. Then after that, after about a year and a half, I joined another startup called iMeme, and I had a very by-the-book startup experience where we had an office downtown Palo Alto, we drank gourmet coffee, we ate organic food, we had all the perks of startups. Then the growth came, we moved into the brick wall office in San Francisco. Um, so it's, it's very classic, you know, these growing pains. And, but then, of course, we got sued <laughs> by one of the uh, music labels because we were providing, we were, their, we were the music streaming service, and unfortunately, lawsuits come as a given. And ultimately, the company was sold to um, MySpace. Um, so while at I mean, I thought I felt that my life was, or I, it was going really well, but I thought, well, it's a bit one-sided. I, I lack diversity. I lack, I need something else. Like, it's really one-sided. And I thought, I need some, some other things. What can I do? I think I tried improv theater at the time. And then I thought, well, since I was a teenager, modeling always seemed kind of interesting. Um, so I approached the photographic community and realized I need to lose some weight. Yes. Um, but then I worked on my portfolio, and about six months later, during my lunch break from work, I went to this agency in San Francisco. I was quite surprised that they said yes. So they signed me up. And so for the next, again, a year and a half, two years, I worked with them. And I have to give credit to my manager. He was really open. He said, well, as long as it's not detrimental to your work, please experiment. Please play with it. And I think this is the very vibrant scene in, in the Bay Area. Very People are encouraged to do whatever they want, if they're productive. Uh, it's me. Um, and just to finish, I want to leave you with this quote. 
Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. We already know that the new trends and technologies will bring us plenty of opportunity. It's up to us, and I think this is our first step to decide what kind of preparation we need to make luck happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katja.